from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. I have been given instructions by Josh Shepard to split the difference. We're not starting at 8.30 so that we can let as many of you uh, gather in this room as possible, but he said do start at 8.45, so I am saluting Josh Shepard and starting. Good morning. My name is Gregory Luco. I am um, chief of the Library of Congress's National Audiovisual Conservation Center, headquartered at the library's Packard campus in Culpeper, Virginia, about 75 miles southwest of here, and still encompassing all the activities, traditional activities of the library's motion picture and bro broadcasting and recorded sound division. Welcome to the Montpelier Room of the Madison, the Madison Building. Um, there's a connection there. In fact, um, if you go down into the lobby, um, you'll see a statue in a hallway of James Madison, which is the federal government's official recognition of our fourth president, as is this building. So welcome to the Library of Congress. Um, you're actually going to get two welcomes for the price of one this morning. My colleague Eugene Flanagan will be talking about um, all of the national planning and coordination activities that the library does on behalf of preservation activities, including radio. And I'll be focusing a little bit more on the internal work that the library does in the domain that you'll be talking about here uh, today and tomorrow. The National Audiovisual Conservation Center is part of the Library Services Unit of the Library of Congress. It's the largest unit in the Library of Congress, about 1,500 people, which provides all the National Library Services of the Library of Congress, where the Preservation Center in Culpeper is probably the largest single division of the 50-some divisions within library services, within the Library of Congress. And we're one of the few here that, um, that uh, works in all three of the ways in which any archive, library, or museum can structure itself. We collect by format. We serve by function, not only acquisition and cataloging, but also preservation. And uh, we collect and provide access and focus on subject. Uh, in this case, the, the history of radio, its creators, its industries. Uh, it, that's all what we do at the Packard campus. We acquire, we catalog and describe, we store, we preserve. We have three preservation laboratories at, in Culpeper, one for film one for video and one for audio. And we serve to our research patrons here and through a range of access initiatives. This is the 10th anniversary of the NAVCC. That's our acronym for National Audiovisual Conservation Center. So we've been at that for about 10 years. Um, we're also written into the legislation that authorized the National Film Preservation Board and the National Recording Preservation Board. The NAVCC is part of that law that uh, written in and as to uh, help implement the national plans that the Library of Congress has published in the last couple decades for uh, recorded sound collections and for our nation's moving image heritage. The collections of the Library of Congress itself, the audiovisual collections, we have some 3.6 million audio collections, sound recordings, including many hundreds of thousands of radio hours and items. We collect commercial, public, and government produced materials from national networks to local stations, programming of news, dramatic programming, music, sports, talk radio, in fact, talk radio actually um, uh, embodies one of our more recent initiatives. Um, another law that we have, that um, the Library of Congress have, has, is called the American Television and Radio Archive Act. It was part of the Copyright Act of 1976. It mandates that the Library of Congress establish and grow um, an American Television and Radio Archive. Uh, we've recently um, expanded the regulations governing that act to include uh, a unique authority to uh, be able to capture um, unpublished audiovisual transmissions from, from any format, from any venue, whether satellite, cable, off-air, 
off internet, uh, satellite radio, FM radio, and a number of years ago, um, we began capturing uh, political talk radio, talk radio in general with a special focus on, on uh, political talk radio. That's an activity still ongoing. Um, you can see what we've been capturing over the years at our uh, Recorded Sound Research Center website. So we are constantly have radio on our minds as we continue to acquire and preserve our audiovisual collections. Our newest major activity you're going to be hearing more about um, throughout the Congress, this conference, and this afternoon especially, um, is our collaboration with WGBH uh, Educational Foundation up in Boston. Uh, this, we're going into our third year now of having assumed the responsibilities for managing the ongoing preservation development of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Uh, AAPB, an initiative established by the Corporation uh, for Public Broadcasting a number of years ago. And about three years ago, WGBH and the Library of Congress assumed responsibility for continuing that. Um, to, to date, we have um, ingested into our data center, our digital archive at the Packard campus, um, over 71 radio collections from around the country um, with Numerous more in the pipeline being developed through grant initiatives and uh, negotiated agreements with radio stations. Um, this broad initiative to um, capture uh, publicly funded media um, in the United States is off to a, a great success and I hope that many of you will be attending this afternoon's 2 p.m. Uh, 50th anniversary celebration of public broadcasting in this country. You're going to see a, an all-star cast of uh, dignitaries in this room later this afternoon. So um, you'll be seeing um, a lot of other Library of Congress staff here and, and tomorrow on various panels that so can fill you in on more details. I want to conclude just by giving um, some thank yous. I consulted with Josh Shepard earlier, and we do have a number of people that I would like to thank now not only on behalf of the library, but also um, the leadership of um, the uh, uh, National Radio Preservation Task Force, um, including all of the Radio Preservation Task Force conference directors, project directors, caucus chairs, and all of you participants, um, the Association for Recorded Sound Collections, uh, CLEAR, uh, the International Communication Association, National Communication Association, NPR, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the National Council on Public History, MEMNON, and the National Recording Preservation Foundation. And a number of individuals, uh, Michelle Hilms, uh, conference director, Sam Berlowski, Stephanie Sapienza, Trevor Munoz, Ross Johnson, Pieter Bierstecker, Julie Rogers, Justin Wynn, Laura Sotabara, Jan Jones, Mike Casey, Laura Sawyer, David Park, Paige Hunter, Trevor Giles, Brandon Burke, Jane Curry, Sean Van Coor, Wendy Shea, and a special shout out to Christine Eric, the communications director for the task force for the article in the Washington Post that appeared yesterday on uh, this gathering and radio preservation in general. Um, and of course, um, the library needs to thank Josh Shepard for his tireless efforts in developing the task force. And of course, um, I know he wishes he could be here today as well, the founder of the task force, Chris Sterling who I'm sure extends his warm welcomes to all of you as well. It is an amazing network of a couple of hundred institutions that have come together to create this digital humanities empire of creators and archivists and academics who are working together to focus on radio history and preservation. I commend you all and I welcome you all. Thank you very much. You'll introduce yourself, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't just contribute to introducing Jean, Eugene Flanagan, who is the Director of National Programs 
and uh, the National and International Outreach Unit of the Library of Congress, Eugene. Good morning. Actually, if uh, those of you politely sitting at the back, if you'd like to grab a, a seat, now's a good time. Won't force you, but there's plenty of seats here and to the side. So thank you, Greg. Uh, as he says, I'm director of national programs, and it's uh, my great good fortune that some of those include uh, the National Recording Preservation Board and the National Recording Registry uh, and their film counterparts. Uh, we had uh, the meeting of the film board yesterday, and we also had uh, a terrific event um, uh, promoting the work of the board and the registry uh, when there was a conversation between the Librarian of Congress and the director, Christopher Nolan, last night. And uh, I'm hoping we sort of uh, mirror that uh, to help support and promote um, the recording uh, board and registry. And the board meeting is coming up in December. Uh, the registry will be announced in March. And so uh, we'll be working to see what we can do uh, along similar lines. Uh, the library is delighted to welcome so many institutions, as Greg uh, mentioned, uh, 200 and individuals that are registered, 300, uh, to participate uh, over the next couple of days. Yesterday we saw forums, panels, and workshops uh, take place uh, at the Woodrow Wilson, uh, National Public Radio, and the University of Maryland, and here now at the Library of Congress. Or as the online conference schedule describes uh, the library, the big boxy building with pillars. <laughs> But it obviously helped, because most of you are here today. So given the depth and breadth of participation, it should come as no surprise that this radio preservation project is, of one, is one and maybe uh, the largest digital humanities and media initiatives in the discipline today. And for those of us in cultural institutions, uh, big boxy buildings with pillars, uh, used to marking progress in decades, this has come to pass in relatively short order that I find uh, very impressive uh, and, and commend everybody involved. In 2013, just to give you a sense uh, of the pace, under the auspices of the National Recording Preservation Board, the library released the Library of Congress National Recording Preservation Plan, a comprehensive blueprint and call to arms to save America's recorded sound heritage for future generations. The report drew from findings that many recordings of radio broadcasts were untraceable, that numerous transcription discs of national and local broadcasts had been destroyed, and that little was known of what still existed, where it was stored, and in what condition. A year later, uh, a key recommendation uh, was to implement uh, the Radio Preservation Task Force, and this was formed in 2014 to spearhead the effort to identify challenges and develop strategies to collect and preserve American radio broadcasts and content. And in 2016, the task force convened its first national conference. Subsequent collaboration in the years since has seen several projects launched, including the Public Memory Project, a national project to preserve the history of public media, a national project to study and preserve Cold War communications history, uh, a beta program for publicly accessible big data search engine to locate archival collections and aggregating information about hundreds of archival collections across the country. And here we are today in late 2017 uh, at the second annual conference uh, ready to fire up the engines for the year ahead. So why is this pace, this sense of urgency important? It's important because the task at hand to quote the title of an Atlantic article, is saving historic radio before it's too late. Uh, a sentiment that was repeated uh, in, as Greg says, uh, the Post article yesterday. We know that radio, like film, has played a vital role in the last hundred years of our history. From the mid-1920s until the 50s, radio was the nation's preeminent source of entertain entertainment and news information. And today, despite the multiplicity of generations, options, devices, and platforms, there are still more than 14,000 radio stations in the United States, and radio is still a major source of information that 93% of us listen to, even millennials. I was surprised, 91%. Radio is an irre irreplaceable part of our sociocultural heritage, a key part of our social memory, and a ubiquitous, if perhaps underappreciated, force in our daily lives. As you all know, uh, and much better than I do, and I appreciate your patience, radio preservation presents unique challenges. 
the magnitude of the material produced, its ephemeral nature, the deregulation and consolidation of radio stations, the lack of technology to preserve early broadcasts, general institutional neglect, emerging formats, and underrepresentation of diverse genres are all contributing factors in the crisis facing the preservation of America's radio heritage. So much was never captured, and much that was has since disappeared. Our preservation consciousness has, of course, been raised in recent decades, and many libraries and archives have acquired collections of radio broadcasting recordings. But there has been few systematic efforts to collect commercial radio broadcasting and to document and preserve the entire range of extant broadcasts in private and public collections. For the latter, happily, of course, there is now the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. But that still leaves the vast expanse of commercial and independent nonprofit radio that is found at both the national and local levels. This essential work remains to be done, and this is why we are here today. The task force and its three-day conference is the first national attempt by mass media historians and archivists to assess the history and record of radio in the United States. And for that, and I second Greg uh, in this, I applaud Chris Sterling, uh, Josh Shepard, the task force, uh, the conference committee, and all of you here today participating over the next couple of days over uh, the 22 uh, uh, odd sessions. Thank you very much and the best of luck. I should probably, uh, this is where you get up and disperse. I should probably give you a little guidance for that. There are four sessions that follow. One of them stays in this room, so if you're here, stay. Uh, dining rooms A and dining, and dining room C are just right on the other side of this wall, just a few steps away. And the Mumford, which is where the other session is being held, is the, the, the big room right behind where you registered this morning, where the registration desk was off the elevators. So here, to there, and the Mumford, that's where the four sessions are meeting. Good luck. Um, this panel is um, entitled Indigenous First Nations, looking at media archives in general um, coming from our tribal communities. And since we're getting a late start, I just want to also just mention that we're going to keep a, the presentations a little tight uh, with some room, hopefully, to leave for some of your questions. Um, it, this panel wraps up around 1045. My name is Jenny Monet. I'm a tribal citizen of the Pueblo of Laguna, which is a tribal nation in New Mexico. I'm an indigenous journalist, and I'm so honored to be here at this awesome conference um, where we get to talk and nerd out on uh, a topic that I really love, which is indigenous media. Uh, it, allow me to introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to assist them in working around all of the files that we have here today. Uh, starting from my left, we have Lina Ortega. She's a tribal citizen of the Sac and Fox Nation out of Oklahoma and is speaking to us from work that she does with the University of Oklahoma. Uh, to her left is uh, Melissa Begay, who is uh, here representing Native Public Media. Uh, Loris Taylor was originally intended to be here, and Melissa works very closely with Loris, and I know that she will bring in the same remarks that Loris would have today about Native Public Media um, and tribal radio. Uh, to Melissa's left is Michael Pond with the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. I'm looking forward to your remarks as well, Michael. Thank you for being here. Uh, to Michael's uh, left is Simon Moya Smith, uh, an independent journalist and uh, soon to be author of his uh, first book. Simon also is uh, going to be speaking to us from his uh, recent work of Indian Country Today, which actually shuttered in early September. And so it'd uh, be very interesting to hear what you have to say about the archives uh, happening from Indian Country Today. And then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we have our uh, discussant, Amalia Cordova, who comes to us from the Smithsonian Folk Life. And she's really going to bring um, context to the greater indigenous worldview of uh, how these narratives are shaped and formed. So without further ado, I just want to get started with some of the conversation here today. And Melissa, uh, if you would like to come up here, I can certainly help with um, navigating any of the uh, presentations here. Please. Thank you. Is this how you like it? Yeah. Okay. 
Yad eha bene. She a Melissa Begay and she, Lizeth Lennon and Shango Kia Ani Bashish Chin, and she a dasha chedo, Hachini a dashanella, Tudinez Dizada a nasha, a hot ego a stun in Nishla. Good morning. My name is Melissa Begay. As you heard Jenny mention, I am with Native Public Media. I'm a member of the Navajo Nation in Arizona. And I'm here today filling in for Loris Taylor, as um, Jenny had mentioned. She was unable um, to be with us today. The presentation today is going to focus on endangered collections and the need for expanded academic study on the cultural history of radio and, the general, and in general, the history of media serving Indian country. Not much has been compiled or collected but what we do know are bits and pieces of an incredible story. It is generally perceived that indigenous peoples, culture, and traditions are kept alive through oral traditions, generation to generations for thousands of years. When you think about it, that's a lot of information to retain and to share. However, not all nations use oral traditions. Some nations use birch bark to capture their writings, and there were and are other examples of written language used by indigenous people. Between 1809 and 1821, Sequoia, also known as George Guess, created the Cherokee syllabary. Sequoia, a Cherokee silversmith, simply just wanted to write his own name, like other silversmiths want to sign his work. He first tried picture graphs, but found that this would have required thousands, thousands of symbols. He designed a symbol for each syllable in the Cherokee language. The Cherokee, the Cherokee symbol, or the Cherokee syllabary for the written Cherokee language came into being in the late 1810s. In the 1828, the Cherokee nation adopted the Cherokee syllabary. And in 1911, the, Sm the Smithsonian um, preserved the language. The Cherokee Phoenix was the first Native American newspaper, the first issue published in English in Cherokee using the Cherokee syllabary in February, 2000, or February 21, 1980-28. Elias Binet was the first editor of the Cherokee Phoenix. He named the Cherokee Phoenix as a symbol of renewal for the mythical bird that rose to life from the ashes of fire. The nation founded the paper to gather support and help keep members of the Cherokee Nation united and informed. It was also a platform to discuss political decisions that eventually result in the Trail of Tears. And it was a part of a movement to help the Cherokee Nation create self-governing institutions in the new capital of Ikota. Other tribal nations beside the Cherokee also started to print newspapers. They include the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Creek, and were influenced by tribal leaders and gave an official voice to the elders and leadership. Most newspapers were tribally owned and few owned by individual tribal members. In 1935, the second Native American paper, The Shawnee Sun, was published both in English and Shawnee also using the English alphabet. It was suspended in 1838 and resumed in 1841. <coughs> by 1858, there was a Chickasaw and Choctaw Herald, and by the 1840s, tribes were investing in official papers. Both, tri both tribal papers and native writers were active through the 1850s. However, as the political situation of tribes shifted to that of assimilation and allotment, publishing, and publishing had weakened and declined. To this day, tribal officials or the tribal government usually control tribal newspapers. And as you see on the slide, a little bit history and timeline of the newspapers starting from Sequoia to the 2000s. It's also important to mention Myrta Edelman was the first Native American woman to own a mainstream newspaper. In 1898, Myrta launched the Twin Territories, which focused on tribal Indian territory in Oklahoma. Myrta's sister, Ora Edelman, 
um, later became Reed, served as an editor and chief writer for Twin Territories. Between 1900 and 1940, publishers and editors supported assimilation, controlled most public, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. From between 1900 and 1940, publishers and editors who supported assimilation controlled most publications. A number of tribal publications were started during this period. A few of them are the California Indian News, 1935, the Winnebago Chieftain, 1905 in Nebraska, the Claremore State Herald, 1905 in Oklahoma, the Rossville Reporter, 1913 in Kansas. Now moving on to Native Radio, KYUK was the first tribal radio station, went on air in 1971, followed by KDKB in Pine Hill, New Mexico in 1972. 46 years later in 2017, that has grown to approximately 59 tribal radio stations across Indian country. Native Radio is a powerful network of individuals and organizations that support and encourage one another. Radio stations are often owned and operated by Native American and indigenous groups, many on tribal lands, in tribal communities, and also a few in urban areas. Radio programs and series are developed by Native producers focused on Native issues and cultures. Native radio is significant to both Native and non-Native audiences for a number of reasons. It gives indigenous communities a powerful voice that reinforces a sense of community through the lens of their own language. It can provide news from, from the Native point of view and health programs focusing on local issues and local needs. It can broadcast music and cultural programs that support traditional and non-traditional Native artists. In 2013, Perry, Peggy Berryhill, a 42-year veteran radio producer, stated, we love Native radio. The announcers sound like us. We hear the latest music, we hear the latest news, we hear our language, and we hear emergency, we hear emergency information that can save lives. Native people through the world had little, if any, opportunity to hear their language over the radio. Majority of cultures dominated the airwaves and most nations saw little value in supporting indigenous cultures in any form. It is through tribal radio, tribal members can hear their language and possibly rescue it from extinction. Since radio was an oral medium, it appeared to be ideally situated for this purpose. In 2012, 21 stations broadcasted in their tribal language. A year later, that grew to 36 radio stations broadcasting in their tribal language. And you see a few um, examples on, on the screen there. Native radio strengthens the retention of native and indigenous languages. It supports arts and cultural initiatives it airs discussions of current affairs from perspective of indigenous people and continues to bridge the cultural divide. Moving from native radio, I want to now highlight some Native Americans in mainstream media, Native American journalists. Tanya Baby, a member of the Colitz Tribes of Washington State, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, was one of the first Native American hired by a non-Native owned TV station, KIRO TV in Seattle in the early 1970s. Heidi Kaufman, a Nez Perce tribal member, started her broadcast career on college radio at the University of Minnesota. In 1987, she worked for Good Morning America as a special correspondent and substitute news anchor. Then joined CBS This Morning in 1990, where she also served as a special correspondent and um, substitute anchor. 
We have Mary Kim Titla, a member of the San Carlos Apache tribe who became the first Native American television journalist in Arizona in 1987. She worked for KVOA in Tucson and P KPNX in Phoenix, Arizona. These pioneers, Native television journalists, led the way for many others, such as Andy Harvey, Charlie at City, and others. And then we have our television station, FNX, First Nation Experience, airing in 2011. The Cheyenne Arapaho Television Station in 2012 in, from, in Oklahoma. And then just recently in 2014, the Gila River Broadcasting Corporation, the Gila River Indian Community in Arizona. We also have tribal um, web-based media. Indian Country Today Media Network launched in 2001 and is a news aggregator. ResCast, a native video and music sharing site created in 2005 by the Coraline Tribal IT Department. According to ResCast's website, this is a place where they can create their own tribal shows, report, report on own, their own tribal programming and their own native content. It is their hope and their intent that tribal people will use technology's greatest strengths to preserve the greatest truths. And then we have IndianCountryTV.com, which streams news from Indian Country and Indian Country TV. And then the Chickasaw TV. Chickasaw Nation TV is a high-definition online video network owned by the Chickasaw Nation, focusing on tribal history, traditions, arts, cultural, and services. The website consists of nine channels, government, commerce, news, history, and culture, arts, and humanities. The website currently contains hundreds of short videos covering Chickasaw government programs and services, events, and issues. This map displays Native American media today. In yellow are the radio stations across Indian country. Purple are podcasts. Red are weekly podcasts. Blue represents newspapers across Indian country. And then green represents blogs by Native Americans across Indian country. We know that new technology are changing Native radio and media in radical ways. Broadband internet provides opportunity for online streaming, satellite radio, and distribution of programs. Also, low-cost digital technologies such as tablets, cell phones, and other devices have broadened access to tribal media as well. So good things are happening, the good things are going on in Indian country. There is a small collection of native media, and native public media encourages academia to, do, to be more open to collecting and archiving tribal media. Again, thank you so much for being, um, inviting Native Public Media here today. Again, my name is Melissa Begay. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And what an appropriate uh, introduction to this panel discussion, I think. I really appreciate the overview. Um, Lena, would you like to go next? Sure. OK, that'd be great. Um, I'll just go ahead and put this up here. And would you feel comfortable being here at the podium? OK. Great. Now, again, let me know if I can assist you with any uh, navigation in getting your files. Just put this up here. OK, and now yours is not this one. This. downloaded it as well, correct? Yes. Okay, here it is. There's that. Now, um, to access your audio files, mm -hmm. escape. Mm -hmm. 
side. And if you just move the cursor down, I'm gonna pull up iTunes. Okay. Okay? Does that sound okay? Yeah. Great. I'm gonna bring that down and bring your Okay, thank you for that transition. Okay. okay, all right, thank you. Minwap and Nikonic, I'm really thrilled to be here today to talk about um, the Indians for Indians Hour radio program. It started on April 1st in 1941, and it was broadcast from the WNAD uh, AM station um, right on the campus of the University of Oklahoma. And from the very beginning, it was a very popular show. It was the creation of Don Whistler, who was a Sac and Fox um, Indian. And he was also chief of the tribe at that time. He had been educated um, in Sac and Fox country. He grew up in Sac and Fox country. And then as a young man, he attended the University of Oklahoma. And then um, he also went to the University of Pennsylvania and worked in the, in the museum as a curator and also uh, as a lecturer and performer. And so these are a couple of photographs of him from when he was a young man. And uh, on the right, you see him wearing a headdress, which is not what Sack and Fox uh, warriors or chiefs traditionally wear, but he would wear it during his performances. And um, he would, whenever he was lecturing to Boy Scouts and other groups in Pennsylvania, uh, he, he performed dances and songs from other tribes, not just the Sac and Fox. Um, this photograph is from later in life, and he's talking to one of the anthropologists on campus at our Natural History Museum. And um, I think this photograph is from about the same time that he would have uh, started the Indians for Indians Hour, and he was also its host for its first 10 years from 1941 through 1951. And he, um, he invited Native Americans from all over the state. He had a wide network, evidently, uh, in central Oklahoma, in western Oklahoma, and some getting into the eastern part of the state, but maybe not so much, because there are a few tribes that really aren't well represented in the radio show. Um, it was broadcast on Tuesday afternoons for half an hour at one o'clock, but it was called Indians for Indians Hour, popularly. Um, so that's just the weekly schedule. This is a, a program schedule from 1948. Um, this one is also from 1948, and it talks about uh, the popularity of the show. It says, more and more Indians are finding Indians for Indians to be one of their favorite series. The programs include real Indian music, songs, and dances presented by representatives of tribes from all over the state. Don Whistler arranges for the appearance of these groups and is in complete charge of the series. And he was, he was very explicit that this program was being put on by Indian people and it was for Indian people and he never wavered for that, from that. Um, however, once he did invite someone uh, sometimes, usually it was groups, sometimes individuals. Uh, he let them take it from there. He would introduce them, he would make some comments, and then uh, he would let them do whatever they wanted to, uh, sing whatever they wanted to. Um, there was also a lot of, um, the program mostly was performances and music, and I'll get into details in that a little bit later, but also it was um, spoken too. There were speeches, there were prayers, and so um, he let, once people were there, he let them do what they wanted. Uh, the only thing is he didn't want anyone getting into political discussions. Uh, Indian country um, politics can get kind of, always has, probably always will, can get kind of uh, heated sometimes. That was not the format of the show. Um, the Western History Collections at OU is one of the special collections in the library, and we also house the university archives. So that's where some of this material is coming from. Um, we're fortunate to have Whistler's logbook um, that he created for planning his show. And this is uh, a couple of pages from it. 
And the arrangement of the book is kind of interesting. He would put paper in this binder, and then um, as time went on, he would add to the top of it. And so this first page from the first programs in 1941 is actually at the end of the book. Um, so we have his first show, April 1st, and then the second show uh, on April 8th, um, you probably can't see it, but it says Yellowfish, a Tockney. And this is one, I actually don't know if, uh, if Yellowfish sang on this program, but he did talk. This is one of the recordings that it no longer exists. Um, not, every, not every program was recorded or the recordings were saved. And then I think there were some that were recorded and they've been lost over time. Um, so anyway, Yellowfish had participated in the Battle of Adobe Walls. So this is 1941, and I believe he's in his 70s at this time, and that battle was, I believe, in 1874 in Texas. And it was kind of the last stand, if you'll want to put it that way, for the Comanche. And so he's, he was there, he was a teenager when this was going on, and so that's what he's talking about during this, during this episode. So it's uh, tragic that that recording doesn't exist. Um, the content of the show, as I said, it mostly was music, but it was a variety of music. It was powwow music, so it included war dances, what we now refer to as intertribal songs. Uh, it had round dances, war mother songs, um, 49 songs. It also had uh, religious music of different kinds. Some of it would be Christians um, singing Christian hymns, but it was different denominations from churches all, from all over the state. And so some of these hymns would be from more of the Eastern tribes, like the Creek or the, uh, the Seminoles. And then you would also have uh, more of the Western tribes in Oklahoma represented. Uh, Rainy Mountain Church in Kiowa country is one example. And so these groups would be, uh, they would come and perform. Um, there would also be stomp dance music. And then also ceremonial music, you know, traditional tribal ceremonial music, which is a little surprising to me. Um, some of the songs, for example, are Sundance songs from the Cheyenne or the Arapaho tribes. And it uh, astonishes me that they actually perform that on live radio and we still have these recordings. So that, that's something that I'd really like to talk to the tribe about. You know, what do you think of this now? Um, as far as some of the spoken content goes, some of it is talks about history. Uh, there's a lot of it in, in a tribal language and so we don't necessarily know what they're saying. And um, there's a lot of tributes to veterans and school groups would often come and perform too. And so sometimes we have students um, talking or they're singing. Um, it's like Whistler gave them an opportunity for both the elders to perform and to participate in this show. And then also for um, the young people to do that as well and, and kind of uh, show their elders that they're carrying things on. So I'd like to go ahead and play a few clips for you. I'm not certain this is going to work correctly, but let me see. Yeah, I did escape. Just get a step faster. OK. Here's the iTunes. OK, thank okay, you. I can't be open, and then just click on whatever it has. OK. This first one I'm, I'm going to play. Um, is Whistler himself, and so I'd, I'd like for you to hear his voice. And he normally didn't venture into politics, but he does have some commentary here. We're not gonna hear it all just because of the length, but uh, he's talking about the NCAI urging um, Indian people to write their congressman about a proposed bill that was in the House at that time. Indians with Don Whistler. Oh, Nikan Keshkikashinina. This 
is the 353rd program of the Indians for Indians hour, Keshekai speaking. Before we start on this program, which is going to be a continuous affair without me, but me in the place, make one little announcement here. It seems that someone is always introducing bills in Congress asking for things for Indians without ever taking the trouble to ask the Indians whether they want it or not. The National Congress of American Indians just written me a letter saying that there is now in the Senate a bill, H.R. 4725, that's H.R. 4725, to confer jurisdiction on the several states over offenses committed by or against Indians on Indian reservations. The National Congress of American Indians seems to think that... Okay, I'm sorry to cut it off, but it goes on for a little bit longer. Um, so... He always started his show off by saying, Aho, Nikon, Keshkikosh, uh, Anina. And he's saying, hello, friends. Uh, Keshkikosh, that was his clan name. Um, it is I speaking. And so that's what that translates to. Um, another one. This next clip is one of the early broadcasts. It's from 1943. And the speaker is Satok who is uh, Kiowa at this time in 1942, he's 96 years old and he lives to be 107 years old. Um, his name was Hunting Horse in Kiowa and uh, you can only imagine what he must have seen in his long lifetime during a period of enormous change. So here's a clip of him speaking in Kiowa. singing several types of songs and he doesn't start speaking until a little bit later. Uh, I apologize but the way that I made the clips doesn't really transfer onto another person's uh, computer. I can fast forward it but of course it's going to cause some squealing in the meantime. Um, do you think I should try that or just leave it? The cursor. Do you know about when, oh. where the time code is? Yes, it's about 13. Uh, there's 1242, 13. Okay. Let's try that. Okay. Sorry, I probably cut him off in the middle of a sentence, but as you can hear, he, he has a very strong voice. He's speaking in a very animated way, uh, and he, he speaks for several minutes. Um, some of these uh, speeches are combinations of um, just talking about a certain topic, and sometimes they'll go into a prayer. So um, I think this, this clip is... Um, um, I would like to know what he's saying. Really, it's a simple matter of finding out. The Kiowa language is taught on campus, and so we have Kiowa instructors. The campus's uh, tribal liaison is Kiowa, and so um, he, speaks, um, he speaks the language. And so the library, um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but one of our things that we need to do is to draw in some of our colleagues from across, across campus to achieve better descriptions of these episodes. So um, the next one, I'll just do one more 
and again, I'm going to have to advance it some. I think I see how to do it now. He didn't from there. Look at this more level. And we're up. I'm going to have to have it. And I'm going to have to My name is Tom. Okay. I'm going to pause it just for a moment. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, as I said, school, school groups sometimes um, participated. The Pawnee Indian School was a, a frequent uh, group that would come and visit and perform on the show. Sometimes they would sing. In this particular clip, um, the students are very earnestly reading an essay that they had written for school where the general, team has, or general theme has to do with advancement under education. Um, so this particular boy is named Thomas Roughface, and I'll start it. My name is Thomas Roughface. I am 12 years old and in the sixth grade at Pawnee Indian School, Pawnee, Oklahoma. I am a member of the Ponca tribe. Indians today live in a world where old conditions are changing, rapidly changing. Yes, old conditions are changing to new modern ways. Indians do not live in tents and teepees out by themselves as they used to do, but they are living in modern homes and must live and work under modern conditions. Indians today even own stores. Today some Indians own very large and good farms. They earn their own money. Today you see Indians driving around very good cars, going to colleges and working in offices. Indians get good jobs and earn good money, but do they know how to spend it? Um, so he goes on to talk about uh, how Indian people are learning to use banks and, and uh, also in agriculture, uh, learning about erosion and so forth. This, this clip is from 1948, um, you know, some years after the Great Depression and the dust storms in that part of the country. So um, anyway, I just wanted you to hear some of the participants' own voices and get an idea of the variety that's in this radio program. I'm gonna go back to the slideshow now. How do I? Hit play. Do I hit play? Yes, right there. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, the one clip that I didn't play is um, Solomon Kent. It's also from 1948. And he speaks about honoring veterans. And um, this is something that's very important to Native Americans. It's a frequent topic in the, in the show. And um, I find his pattern of speech very interesting because it's repetitive. It takes him um, like four minutes to, to, to say that um, around Memorial Day, people are remembering their loved ones who have passed on, especially um, soldiers who have served and given their life for their country and for their families, and, and it's, it's very moving. Um, I grew up hearing people speak like this, I still do, but um, you know, working uh, where I do and, and in daily life, you don't hear people speak like that quite so much, and so it's just interesting to hear that type of pattern of speech. So. Um, this is just a photograph that was taken of uh, the show. I'm assuming that it happens around Christmas because I think the the design that's on the lady's book is a Christmas tree. Unfortunately, in our files, this couple is not identified and we don't have the date of, of uh, when the photo was taken. The show is extremely popular. It was from the beginning and it continued to be popular. This article is from the student newspaper in 1953. And then, um, um, Unfortunately, Whistler passed away in 1951, and when he died, he was still host of the show and he was still chief of the tribe. And so I'm assuming that he passed away suddenly, but the show continued even after his death. It was sponsored by the Sequoia Club, which is the Indian club on campus, and its staff sponsor was Boyce Timmons, and they carried it on through the 1950s and the 60s and, and into the early 70s. 
Um, the show had become kind of an institution to Indian people across the state, I think. Um, there are files of all these requests that people had written in for announcements that they wanted on the show. And sometimes people would write in requesting to be placed on the schedule. They, they did this regularly. And so these are just a few examples. Um, one of these is the Sequoia Indian Club announcing their uh, homecoming dance. Uh, the Native American Church, uh, the actual state organization, um, announcing their, their annual meeting. Um, the signal evidently reached into Kansas because we have a letter from the Wichita Intertribal Club announcing a dance. And then there's also uh, other correspondence that students from Haskell would write in. And also there were student groups that uh, would come from Wichita to perform on the show. And then we have a whole lot of these handwritten postcards where um, someone is just announcing a um, birthday celebration. They're going to play a hand game to celebrate this young man's birthday. And this is more of the same. We even have an official, we have a government memo uh, wanting the open house for a new Indian Health Service unit to be announced. The Hominy War Mothers announcing uh, a Veterans Day celebration, and so Hominy, this would be the Osage tribe, and uh, the Kiowa Gourd Clan announcing one of their events, and they have their own beautiful, very elegant looking stationery. So um, it's just fascinating to me to see the, the variety of um, forms that people use to request announcements. We have telegrams too. Um, these particular uh, requests are all date from the early 60s, 1960 and 61, so the show is still very vital. Um, this next one, this is kind of changing gears a little bit. Um, it was from that same file, so I assume it's from the early 60s, and it says it is a matter of policy for WNAD to erase all tapes unless specifically requested. And so I think this explains why we don't have recordings for all the episodes. Um, OU has the most complete set. It's a very unique holding. The Library of Congress has um, a couple of reel-to-reel -reel tapes that we do not have from 1943. And they also have um, a copy of reel-to-reels of the 1941 through 1950 shows that they made um, because OU had sent the original acetate disc here to be copied, and then they sent back archival quality copies on reel-to-reel. -reel. Uh, unfortunately, it is not known what happened to the acetate disc. Our records say that they were retained by LOC for preservation, and their records say that they're returned to OU. And so I'm not blaming anyone this has happened. This has been the case for a long time, but. It's just a mystery what happened to those original discs. And then as time went on, the originals are recorded on reel-to-reels. Um, but we don't have all of them. You know, if you think about it being a weekly show, there should be, you know, many reels. But for the decade of the 50s, we only have about 30. It's the same situation for the 1960s. And then we only have seven or eight from the early 1970s, and those tend to just be the annual anniversary shows. But we also have about 30 that are labeled unknown, and so uh, clearly we need to, to find out when they're from and, and uh, what the content is. Um, in the process of preparing a grant proposal to have the reels digitized, I took some photographs uh, to send to some of the vendors because I'm wanting to outsource the digitization of this collection. I do not, neither I nor my staff have the expertise to, to do this. And so um, these are just a couple of the photographs that I had to send to them. And so the remarks were, uh, um, the tape is coming unwound, it's not fixed, um, this is a preservation concern. Uh, on the right, you can see the boxes are still in their original boxes. We haven't rehoused them. Um, we provide access to the show through cassette tapes. Um, copies were made to cassettes in the late 1980s, I believe, and that is what we use when people come into our reading room and request to listen to them. Okay. And they also, um, that's what we use to digitize things just on a one-off basis. Um, 
This last slide just shows our description, how much it can vary, and this is one of the access problems that we experience with this program. On the left, we have one uh, that's very detailed. It lists all the performers. On the right, uh, it says singers, undated, unidentified music and dances on tape 128. So um, it is true that we can listen to the cassette tapes and, and get all this information, but it needs to be done systematically. And also, I have a concern that the cassette tapes are close to 30 years old and they're gonna break. Also, uh, I have noticed the cassette tapes are not always a faithful reproduction of the reels. Um, there's like uh, one episode will just be broken, right? Uh, it'll stop suddenly and another one will start, so it's interrupted. So um, if you're interested in seeing the, the inventory list, please contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. And um, moving forward, like I said, I'm trying to apply um, to CLEAR, to the Council on Library and Information Resources, to their Recordings at Risk grant program to have it digitized and also to get better descriptions. And we're also going to feature the show in an exhibit in the main library next year, and we're hoping that as part of that we'll be able to uh, draw in more members of the campus community and the state community to get better descriptions for the show and do a better job of preserving um, you know, this very unique um, treasure. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Lina, for bringing up some uh, very interesting dialogue to this conversation. Uh, Michael, uh, would you like to go next? Great. Uh, do you, you don't have to step up here. It's wherever you'd like. Oh, well, in that case, I'll just stay right here. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Michael Pond. I'm the head archivist at the National Museum of the American Indian, and I was very gratified when I was asked to be on this panel. Um, is this? We got it. Sorry. Um, I was gratified to be asked to be on this panel, but I also was kind of confronted with the reality, which is that NMAI doesn't have a lot of radio um, in our archive, which is uh, kind of a blind spot for us. So let me tell you a little bit about the National Museum of the American Indian Archive and some radio programming that we have done as a museum, and then talk about why I think um, we need to turn our attention towards collecting radio programming. So the National Museum of the American Indian uh, became part of the Smithsonian in 1990, but the actual origins of the institution date back far longer than that. George Gustav High, who founded the museum, uh, began collecting Native American material culture in uh, the late 1890s, and almost from the beginning conceived of his collection as a museum and then did actually open a museum in 1916. And his concept, as was sort of the uh, fashion of the day, I guess, was that um, Native Americans were dying people. They were going to be uh, 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 um, assimilated into uh, mainstream culture. Their, all evidence of their heritage would be obliterated and it was up to um, wealthy white people like him to collect the evidence of, of their heritage and make it available to other white scholars. And for decades, that's how they proceeded. Um, I think that one of the really fascinating and maybe untold or undertold parts of the story of the National Museum of the American Indian is that transformation from being an institution largely for white people by white people intended for um, you know, sort of a colonialist uh, audience to being an institution run largely by Native people um, who conceives of our audience and our constituency as being the Native people of the Western Hemisphere, that we are a, um, an institution dedicated to documenting the lives of the Native people of the Western Hemisphere and um, largely in support of revitalizing those cultures, of making um, cultural heritage available to community members. So um, we very much think of ourselves as the stewards of the cultural heritage of the Western Hemisphere. Um, 
when George Gustav High began the museum and for many, many years after that, they were, they were really focused on um, this kind of um, unrealistic idea that, that there was sort of a, a, a perfect moment in the past that truly represented what Native people's lives were really like and that they were going to collect and document that stuff. And so um, for a long time, um, archival materials were not really part of the part of the picture because they were looking for archaeological materials or some sort of um, ethnographic materials that met a kind of standard um, that, uh, that they as curators set. So our collections, our archival collections, are not nearly as robust bust or as historical as our material culture collections. And we also have the benefit of being part of the Smithsonian, which has the National Anthropological Archive, which dates back to, you know, their collections date back to the 1860s. So we don't try to collect anthropological records. So in terms of the archive of the Museum of the American Indian, we've kind of been um, triangulating towards a niche. And that niche is that we document the contemporary lives of the native people of the Western Hemisphere and seek to demonstrate the connections that people make and the context that their contemporary lives have with their traditions. And um, so, so we do this by collecting the personal papers of artists and writers and leaders and um, uh, activists and the organizational records of, um, of Native American civil rights organizations such as the National Congress of the American Indian. We have um, about 50 years worth of their papers. Um, so so we're, what, I'm, what I'm kind of driving at is that we seek to contextualize people's contemporary lives and how the traditions that they have been raised in and the continuity of native culture informs those contemporary experiences. Well, radio is a really great medium for that. Um, it's interesting that I, I learned about the Indians for Indians Hour because one of our staff people, a man named Ed Schutman, who uh, runs our national education initiative, used to work at the Library of Congress in the 1970s and I believe that he's the person who might have been responsible for having the Library of Congress um, preserve those acetate recordings. He told me about going to Oklahoma and hearing the uh, Indians for Indians Hour, and um, uh, what a, I mean, what a perfect example of how uh, Native people throughout the world and the Western Hemisphere is no different. They've always used the technology and the mediums uh, at their disposal. This gets to what you were talking about, about newspapers and uh, broadcasting. So, so we do have collections of media producers. We have, for instance, the records of a really fabulous Native American filmmaker and documentarian, Phil Lucas, who, um, uh, made really terrific programs in the late 1970s. He made a series of television programs about the uh, portrayal of Indians in Hollywood and on television. And if, when you watch this Images of Indians, um, it, when you watch it today, it's, it is exactly as current and um, uh, informative as it was when it was made. Uh, I mean, which is kind of a sad statement about the progress that, um, mainstream media has made in representing Native people, but um, he did a really great job of making a fantastic series of documentaries about that. Um, the Museum of the American Indian has made, as far as I am aware of, only one foray into radio production ourselves, and it was in the late 1990s, uh, I believe they were published in 2001, it's a series called Living Voices, and it was produced by two longtime staff people, um, Elizabeth Weatherford, who uh, just recently retired, but for over 30 years ran our film and video public programs. And Keevan Lewis, who um, also just retired, but Keevan um, uh, ran a really great program bringing Native artists in to work with collections, um, which uh, is just a really special thing about NMAI. I, I, 
it's one of the more gratifying things about working there. So Living Voices was 40 short profiles of um, Native people and, uh, and uh, leaders, contemporary leaders. It's kind of assembled from more than, I think, 100 separate interviews. And um, in addition to the 40 episodes that are in English, 20 of them were also um, in Spanish. They, because as I've mentioned several times, we are a hemispheric organization. We represent uh, and collect um, uh, people, Native people of the entire Western Hemisphere, including Hawaii. We don't actually collect Hawaiian materials, but we do programming about Hawaiian, uh, Native Hawaiian uh, people. So that program, Living Voices, um, is freely available online. You can listen to it. You can buy CDs or DV, um, no, not DVDs, just CDs of it. But um, the uh, original recordings and the, the production materials are also available. I mean, obviously, uh, these are um, in-depth interviews that were edited down. That's sort of the nature of media production. So. We are aware as an institution of the value of broadcasting, of the value of radio. It isn't an area that we have collected um, with a great deal of focus, but I ask all of you as participants in uh, the Radio Preservation Task Force and um, people who think about this all the time, to please think of the National Museum of the American Indian as a repository for um, radio programming. We are fortunate to have a really fabulous um, a, incredible um, collections facility, the Cultural Resources Center, located in Suitland, Maryland, about seven miles from here. That's where the archive is based, and we have um, the infrastructure of the Smithsonian to help us with our preservation concerns. So um, please think and help me learn more about um, indigenous radio programming and collecting opportunities. So I'm here, and if you'd like to contact me, uh, I have business cards. I would love to to hear from you and speak with you and, and learn about the poten potential collaborations or collections that may be uh, out there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Simon, would you like to make some remarks next? Uh, is this on? Uh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm usually on my third cappuccino by now, so I only had a small black coffee, so. This is painful. How? Hihaniwashte. Samana Machiapolo, Namalakota. Le Iuha Uhipiki washte. My name is Simon Moya Smith. I'm a, I'm a reporter, I think. And um, I'm not objective. I give my opinion. Uh, I bring the native lens. You know, I mean, that's the thing is like, somebody once asked me if I was a, uh, you know, so you cover Indian country, you just cover native news. Like, no, I'm a native reporter and I bring the native lens to news. And, you know, by the way, happy Native American Heritage Month. It is. This is Native American Heritage Month. This is, where, this is the time where we get to recognize um, us and our resilience. That we survived the Founding Fathers. We survived westward expansion. We survived boarding schools massacres, murders, rapes, all of it. And this is a time where we get to celebrate the fact that we survived all these people who have statues to themselves all over this, this district of Christopher Columbus. And people forget that. People don't, I mean, we just go and just say Washington, D.C. No, it's Columbia. This is the district of Christopher Columbus. And what's the sports mascot? I mean, think of the message that we're sending to people every day. To, to know that we're in the district of Christopher Columbus and the sports mascot is, is a reference to a time where we were bountied. And at the same time, we're the most likely to be killed by cops. And people don't know that. We're here talking about media, right? And the fact that we're so still canceled out of the American conversation across the board. I've gotten phone calls from my fellow African-American colleagues saying, hey, I'm about to go on Fox Business. Can you tell me a little bit about natives? I'm about to talk. And it's like, then why are you going on? Nobody, I, I, don't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't call my African-American colleague and say, hey, 
I'm going to go and talk about Black Lives Matter. No, I'd be like, I would sit down and you should be doing this. But that's the problem is that we are the uncomfortable reminder of what this country has done, is doing, and will continue to do unless we're included in these discussions. Um, so one thing, I, I just went on a tangent. Um, one thing I like to start doing, though, is I like to, we have to recognize that all of us are sitting here right now still on, on indigenous territory. And they are not here it predominantly not because they decided to leave voluntarily. That just because they weren't white Christian, they were aggressively and forcibly removed. So let's recognize that we are all right now because I'm Oglala, my people are in the Pine Ridge Res in South Dakota and the Black Hills, even I'm a beneficiary of aggressive native removal in this territory. So we need to recognize our privilege in that sense. And we hear that all the time, you know, it's like, oh, my, my family's had this home for six generations. Well, it's still Indian land. You know, and we like to talk about, oh, my, my people are like, you know, I, I, I used to uh, hang a lot with uh, a lot of veterans uh, in Denver because my grandpa was a veteran, so I'd go to these places and they'd say, oh, well, we've always fought for this country. No, you haven't always fought for this country because it hasn't always been in America. There are restaurants in Italy still pumping out biscotti that are older than this nation. And we, we, we miss that in the language. And that's, uh, that's, I guess, my part in this is that the native voice and lens and language that's what we're talking about, the preservation of some of our languages that are on, that like some elders will, will not speak because of trauma. My master's thesis included a, a, an Oglala woman who would not speak the language because she was so traumatized because she went through boarding schools that it gave her a sick feeling in her stomach to even speak her language. It was so traumatic. And so I didn't plan on being a journalist. I just thought how white people use language was so fickle and it was entertaining to me that they could say something and not mean that. And I'm like, okay, I have to figure these people out. And that's when I, and I knew that as a kid because I, they would, well, that's not what I meant. This is what I said, but that's not what I meant. And that was so interesting to me that it was so fickle. It was so thin and it melts in water. And that was that that became I again didn't plan on being a reporter. I actually was a speechwriter for a state senator trying to repeal Columbus Day in Colorado, where the holiday was founded by Irish, not Italians. Remember that. Um, and I was offered a position with the Rocky Mountain News. And then I realized how much the native language and lens pushes back against the American narrative and makes people uncomfortable. And yet we're the ones that are referenced as being politically correct. It, we're not politically correct. If you want to read anything politically correct, get an American history textbook. And sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm under strict um, rules not to cuss. And um, sometimes when you get fired up. I don't know many people who get fired up and say, what the heck? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I got in trouble for something and actually, you know, that's, I, how I got into journalism was I was pulled into an office at the Colorado State Capitol and they said, you wrote this thing about Columbus Day and you can't do that and you need to take it down. And if you want a future in politics here, you gotta take that down. I'm like, I'm not an editor, I filed it. You gotta talk to my editor. But I realized how that shook the foundation of what people think they know, right? And listen to the language that we've agreed on certain things. You know, for example, we know that the R word, I'm not gonna say it, the name of the team here, is a racial slur that means proof of Indian kill, but yet you can go on CNN, anywhere, NPR, across the board, and people will say some people believe it's a slur. Really, the fact that how we, like the idea of it is defined as such, yet we make this argument why. You, you have to put this qualifier in, in there why. And it's the same thing when it comes to photos. If you just go on any website and it's an indigenous person in regalia, they'll still say costume. We just heard a tape of, of a young boy in the 40s trying to teach people who he was then, and we're still having that same conversation today. Why aren't you listening? Why is it so hard when the native voice comes? Why does it make people shudder? Because it calls into question privilege. 
the idea that the indigenous people did survive everything that it's Thanksgiving, right? People don't want to talk about the idea that we saved them, that they were cannibals. They literally weren't digging and planting crops. They were digging and looking for gold. So when it came time to eat, you know what they did? And this is factually true. They dug up Indian graves and ate the flesh. That's Thanksgiving. We took care of them while they were stealing from us. And after a plague fell through in the area, it, it, there's this whole idea that the pilgrims showed up and that they tilled the, they didn't till anything. They came and the land was already ready to go. But a plague came through because of the Spanish and the Dutch. This is the story, our lens, again, our voice. It's very uncomfortable for people to take all of this in because it does call into question everything you think you know. I mean, and, and, and I, I made some notes here, but I just really want to emphasize that now we are taking media and using it to provide you the truth because it has been used before to, against us, propaganda. Everybody knows um, Wizard of Oz, right? Frank L. Baum. Do you know what he used to write? He used to write columns about how we need to kill Native Americans, all of them. We've wronged them. Oh, it was a Dorothy, and you know, okay, but we need to kill Indians. That's literally what he did. He was writing this beautiful little story that everybody likes to show to their kids while this guy was calling for the genocide of Native Americans. Media was used against us to demonize us and strike fear in people. Now we get to use it to provide you the truth that we aren't merciless Indian savages as it's written in the Declaration of Independence. So we have this opportunity to even close the gap that they tried with reservations, out of sight, out of mind. But now there's that geographic distance isn't there when you have, Jesus, when you have this, right? I mean, now you have the native voice in your pocket, whether that's written, whether that's photography, just right away. So I think um, one of the problems that we're, we're still facing is just getting the native uh, voice, like, welcomed. I'm sorry to say that just welcomed, like the native lens about these. You guys can probably go to a website right now and read something about like a diversity list and we're not included. We're, uh, we're still in the other category. We haven't even moved out of the other category yet. You can go in a room and people, like I was at NBC News and they were celebrating their diversity and they went down the whole diversity list and didn't mention natives. I was just at Columbia, Columbia Journalism where I got my masters. There's not one native. I mean, these are real problems, and it sucks that we have to take it upon ourselves to launch our own websites, our own podcasts, to talk about race and police brutality and sexual assault, all of that. Why aren't we included? That's the question. Why are Native Americans still canceled out of the American conversation? What, what, what does that serve? It doesn't serve anything for any of us. If anything, it affects the situation. So... Um, I can go on like this, and I won't, but I will take questions later. I think the last thing I did want to say was that um, my, my focus of my work, again, is, is to provide also a platform for other natives. So when I was at, you know, well, Indian Country Today is on hiatus, and that sucks because that was a huge platform. And so you imagine all the stories that are not being told right now and all, all the shit, sorry, all the stuff that's happened in the past month and a half, and all of those stories that aren't being told in our about our communities. And um, I tried to provide that platform to people anytime I could, whether it was at Standing Rock or, you know, if it's Oak Flat, etc. cetera. Now I'm, my question is, you know, where are you getting it? Where, do you guys, where are you guys getting your, your native news? Can you go to the New York Times? Can you, where, are you go where are you getting it? And think about that. Anyway. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> For someone with one cup of coffee, that was pretty fired oh, up. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and also, I think it just um, really reemphasizes why we're here and talking about this, the importance of these stories that have their roots um, so far back and yet how much work there is yet to do. Um, Amalia, please, yeah. yes, come, dear. Uh, let me just log back in really fast, and I have your presentation ready to go. Sorry. And just uh, keeping an eye on the time, it's 10.31. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. How do we make this viewable? 
you just start working. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye. Mari Mari Pu, Lamian Pu, Kompucha Inche, Amalia. I'm Amalia, I'm greeting you in Mapuzungun, which is the Mapuche language from the Walmapu territory, which is currently known as Chile and Argentina, which is where I was born. And I'm a language learner still. And I want to also uh, acknowledge the traditional territory, the Piscataway Nation, on which we are gathered here today. And I think Simon's presentation just, you know, opens up. Uh, some of the struggles that are happening across the rest of the hemisphere in terms of the right to communication, which is very tied to the right to exist. Um, I've been working with native media through video mostly, but there is a predecessor of video in Latin America in particular, which is native radio. In many places in Latin America, uh, the native radio initiatives are illegal because of the concessions of the airspace. So a lot of the radio is pirate radio or radio is working on borrowed space. And uh, radio is also a space that's really important because it's more affordable than video and making a film. And it's also can be deployed at any time when something happens. And something did happen recently on October 8th, 2017. Uh, radio producer Efigenia Vasquez was, was shot and killed at uh, occupation of traditional territories in Southern Colombia, Cauca. So I had been on that radio um, like a month and a half before and the uh, Renacer Coconuco radio, which reaches not just the community but spills over into the local city of Popayan. And again, it's an important channel, just, just like in In Country Today and all the other wonderful initiatives we've heard about today, of really getting uh, the lowdown, the real story on what's happening in our communities. And these land occupations that were happening in, in traditional territory are to get back land that the government has already promised to return through constitutional recognition of indigenous territories and through specific agreements. And, and uh, Efigenia was just covering the land recovery and, and, and she was shot. So it's very, it's very sad that we still have um, people who speak out are putting themselves in the spotlight and in the front lines and endangering their lives. So there's a lot at stake and people are willing to do anything to get the message out when it's about survival. So, um, and, Local indigenous radio is very important for local organizing, but increasingly we have uh, migration to urban centers, and those urban centers are not always in our own countries. I myself migrated. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the other indigenous voices in the airspace or in the web space right here in the United States, and one of them is called Quichua Hatari. Quichua Hatari is a Quichua language radio based out of the Bronx, and it's based out of this uh, wonderful basement that Segundo Ancamarca uh, was able to access and create a studio. And this became, along with First Voices Indigenous Radio, the only indigenous radio programs out of New York City. And First Voices Indigenous Radio is actually a, a program that has been on the air for a very long time through the Pacifica Network, uh, run by Teokas and Ghost Horse, and his is a global indigenous program. So I've often gone to that radio to translate, I've brought participants from the Native American Film and Video Festival who also bring urgent stories from home to share and I interpret on the air. So it's, uh, it's really interesting when you have these collaborations that allow us to hear what's going on with our brothers and sisters across the continent. So Kichwa Hatari is kind of a uh, Latin American counterpart to First Voices and it's become a native space and they welcome hip hop artists who are visiting New York and it's multilingual, it's primarily in Spanish and Kichwa but they also wel welcome speakers of, of the variants of Quechua from across the seven countries in the Andes that, that speak the language. But also, if you're native and speak English, then they'll translate into Spanish or Quechua on the air. And this is broadcast um, via Tambo Stereo on the internet, live on um, 8 o'clock at night on Fridays. So Quechua Hatari has come to the Folklife Festival, and we've had a pop-up. And they've been broadcasting and teaching Quechua and playing Andean music. And, that's the first image. This was their stand out at the Folklife Festival this summer. So it can be done now with other means, um, but we have to also look at language not just as a, an isolate, something that is spoken by a group of people in a remote region. Quechua is bringing people together. There's the diaspora of migrants from the Andean area and from the Amazonian areas in Latin America, and they're coming together because of the use of the language through the radio program. And that's been a really beautiful initiative. Um, and then, also, in, in another way, connecting some of the topics that we've just heard today, I think scholarship is really important. We have these archives that are scattered, but it's the scholars who find out and sometimes link them together and can help produce better metadata so that they, we can actually know what is where. 
So I think that's one thing that has to happen. Um, everyone should, all these institutions, and it's wonderful that OU has done it, should look inward and say, well, what native resources do I have? And is it a special collection? Is it scattered? Is it even a collection? Are the resources just sitting there, right? So that's something where NMAI, I think, has a role to play in sort of advising on sort of how do we pull a magnet through and just pull all the native resources together and then start make, thinking about tagging them in ways that are easy, easy to find. I trolled the whole Folkways and Folklife website, but I found that a lot of the resources have the original names. For instance, I couldn't find Purepecha, but I found Tarascan. So the sort of renaming, uh, adding that into the metadata is important to find your ancestors in the archives. So I think that's an important point too. And the names of the languages have also changed as we use the languages of our own creation and not the names that other people gave our people or our languages. So um, this is an, an effort I wanted to share too, which is um, there's a Mapuche scholar who's the head of the Native Studies program now at Austin, Texas. And uh, he's been working with a radio show in Santiago, Chile called Wichanyanay. It means wake up, get up. And it's been broadcast continually, weekly, since 1993 in, in Santiago, Chile. It was actually founded in 93. And it's broadcast in Spanish in Mapuzungon. And the idea was to reach the Mapuche audiences that have migrated to the city where they are becoming assimilated and dispersed. So this is a radio show that really has, again, like Kicho Hatari, brought together communities that are diasporized um, and brought them together through the language. And some people have even revitalized the language by listening to the show because it's completely bilingual, right? So they have actually, um, since they've been recording steadily for 24 years on cassette, right? They have an archive, and they've started a, a GoFundMe campaign to um, raise $6,000 that they need just to build a, a safe space for this archive. And they were working in different radio stations. They didn't have their own stations, so they had like a feminist radio station sponsor them. Then somebody got a job at another one. They moved over there. They've been on Christian radios. I mean, they've just been wherever they can be to broadcast, right? So um, I wanted to show this video. How do I do the notes? Um, I want to see my notes on. I want to see this link. Can I invite? Yeah, I think that's still. I don't still know there. how to do how Melissa got I think it's a presenter. So I think I can just. There. Okay. It's the Facebook thing. There. Okay. Can I, I click on that? Will it come up? Or does it copy it? Yep. All right. That's it. Hello, uh, I am Luis Carcamo Guechante. Uh, now I have the honor to be in the home of Elizabeth Wenchual, Jose uh, Payal, and uh, uh, their family here in the Cerro Navia district in Santiago, uh, the capital city of Chile. And this is a, a moment uh, for all of us to thank all of you who have made contributions, significant contributions, uh, to help uh, the uh, Mapuche radio show Bichage and I. Marimari Kompuche, Uñaña, Flamien, Mañunkelin, Tvachi Chawenmeu, Tvachi Dumumeu, Taman Keyun, Tvachi Dumu, Nyin Fenchen Mañun, Katain Lamien Meo Melepalu Fachante, Mañunkelin. Shaltumai Lamien. Hello everyone, my name is Jan Paiko. Uh, we are so grateful for your cooperation and contribution to this uh, show radio program. Your cooperation is very important for us to support our radio, our radio program, which is called Wichangyanai. Thank you. Inche Jose Bayalo, what you get up in it? Tvata, Inche Tanyi Puche, Tanyi Polaimani, Potom, Nyapo, Nyawe, Nifamo, Nipe Nikar Kama Wichante. Manyum Klen Yamai Tanyi Amulin Tatfachi Dumo, Ni Uchambra Amniafiel, Tatfachi Dumo, Uchanga Nai Pinello, the Omaya in Kinyapchiruka, Pite Inta in Nalemniafiel, Om Chike Gravacion Melelo, Uchanga Nai Meo, the Oma Po Lalo Epe, Epumari Keshu Sipanto, Vichidumo Meo, Vita Manyum Klen Tanyi Amulin Tatfachi Dumo, Tatfachi Keyuntati. Uh, Elizabeth Wenchual uh, and Jose Payal uh, have expressed their gratitude to our, all of you for uh, your contribution here in their home. Uh, 
something else you want to add about what uh, Elizabeth and Jose yep. have said? Yep, All right, thank uh, you. Yes. May, uh, it's just 1040, and maybe yeah. we can share the link. Uh, it's on Facebook, is the, this, or their, kick, their Kickstarter? It's a GoFundMe. Okay, we can find them there. I thank you so much, Amalia. I really appreciate your contributions. And to the panel for just having great patience with the technical technicalities here. And to you, our audience, uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm sure some of the panelists are here um, for questions if you have them. Unfortunately, um, due to our delay, we did not have time to make uh, time for Q&A, but I think People can, s we have five minutes? Yeah. Oh, we have five minutes. Okay, oh, I, I thought the panel ended at 10.40. Um, okay, we have five minutes, so if there is a question uh, from the audience to any one of the panelists, yes, in the back, please. So the question is, in terms of broadcast, is, is there a, a, a searchability yeah. protocol? Is, is there a belief that there are recordings that exist that could be found and potentially archived Absolutely. and made accessible? Yeah. Mm. Uh, or, or is there a general belief that, that it's too much of a concern with law? Lena. Um, yes, I do believe that there are recordings that exist that that need to be found. I don't know that there's a whole lot of them as far as the uh, Indians for Indians Hour radio program goes, but it was an option for participants to request a recording, to request a tape, and so I'm sure that they did. And one of the things that I hope the exhibit will accomplish is to uh, give us a forum for reaching out more to the communities of the state to identify the photographs, to um, help us develop better descriptions of the content, and then also to identify if there are other tapes that exist out there. Um, OU does have an NEH funded grant right now that has to do with preserving music recordings, so it's not talking radio, and they have not had a lot of response to their surveys, um, you know, asking people what are the issues with preserving some of your recordings that you have. So that's a different project, but they're kind of related. Mm -hmm. I can talk to you more at length if you want to. Yeah. Yes, please. Sure. Well, I think Lena touched on some of that too with her presentation and some of the ceremonies that were documented mm -hmm. and really having that kind of insight about what you actually are coming across. Uh, anyone on the, mm -hmm. want to speak to that? Well, no, I was, if we're talking about like even like language preservation and you think of like Rosetta Stone, who's making the money off that? Mm. You know, I mean, I, I, when I go into a store and I see Rosetta Stone and it's an indigenous language and I'm like, who gave you permission? You know, or did you do that on your own? You know, and it's just like we see with like our Inipi ceremonies, our sweat lodges, and you can see people charging seventy dollars to go. And there was that a couple years ago where he killed a bunch of people. One guy did. So I mean, it's about being responsible. But the problem is when it's our things, people think they could just take them, mm -hmm. whether if it's our language, our ceremonies, everything. It's but they can't, and we're we're trying to push back against that. So yeah, there's a level of responsibility, but there is that sense of privilege that I can just take this and do what I want with it. I think I th presentation yesterday by the Wikimedia people and yeah. the team who created a space where things can be annotated and searchable, but at the same time restrict it to who can actually have access to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think I think you're touching on the concept of cultural sensitivity of, of like traditional knowledge systems and and um, you know at a place like uh, a university or a museum, you know, in order to be responsible stewards of, of materials, we have to be responsive to those kinds of community concerns. Um, and it can be really complicated. I mean, there are thousands, I mean, 
of um, Native communities throughout the Americas, and uh, there, you know, there isn't a single Native America. There are hundreds of, of, of tribes and, and communities that believe different things. Right. Um, I think that the uh, maybe where this isn't as quite as big an issue with radio is just that it's been broadcast in the first place. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are are very um, sensitive to what goes out to a broad audience and what doesn't. Um, now, that is, those attitudes have changed over time. Maybe in the 1940s, uh, people, even, even Native people, weren't as necessarily concerned about that. Mm -hmm. But I think increasingly yeah. that's something that people are really aware of. And I would add really briefly that that's why we have uh, organizations like the Association for Tribal Libraries, Archives, and Museums who are probably working mm -hmm. specifically on those topics. Thank you, Amalia and Michael, for that. And one last question. question. Okay, quickly. He's hot, right? I'm uh, basically from Colombia, South America, but I live in Texas. And uh, I'm very glad to hear this kind of conversation. And I appreciate so much what you, what you said. I would like that many more people to have the opportunity to hear that. It breaks my heart to see the change there. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. And thank you, everyone. I'm sure some of the panelists are here for your questions if you'd like to speak. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.